Allagrass and um, with any cartilage uh, procedure yeah, the important thing is, is, is to treat concomitant lesions so the, the, the cartilage lesion is the last thing that you do so it's important to treat instability whether it's an ACL um, with an ACL reconstruction or a PCL whatever is needed if there is more than sort of 50% uh, meniscal loss uh, this is one of my cases previous uh, meniscal repair after an ACL you know so she she needed a um, she was still painful in that area needed a meniscal transplant that needs to be done before any cartilage surgery um, in order to restore some of the biomechanics and then lastly and probably the most important really is the alignment so we need to look at the alignment I think with Oscar Allagrass we probably need to be very aggressive with the alignment um, in order to give it the best chance to incorporate. So Oscar Allagrass have significant strengths and some limitations which are not insurmountable but they are they are significant as well. So the, the good thing about Oscar Allagrass is bone fixation. Um, it's the Highland cartilage, no other technique will guarantee Highland cartilage 100%. Um, and there's no limitation in size, obviously, because um, the you get a whole hemicondyle uh, potentially, and therefore, unlike uh, an allergenic oats, um, you're not uh, limited by donor site morbidity. So the limitations, though, are supply and cost. It's pretty pricey. I will mention that later. Uh, there is limited supply. Um, it. There are logistical issues. It needs to, if you use a fresh uh, allograph, you have to use it within 28 days um, in order to maintain the viability of the chondrocytes um, and and that does affect the outcome. And potentially there is some uh, non-union rates which you, know, you do worry about um, because uh, often you are dealing with large lesions. And in terms of indications, it depends on where you live. If you're in the state, this is the indication. Anything over two square centimeters potentially could be it brought in. If uh, here it's it's a much more sort of valuable resource, so it tends to be uh, much bigger than that and the more severe end of the spectrum. So, but potentially it, it it's uh, indications are revision procedures after failed uh, microfracture uh, or uh, cartilage procedures that involve subchondral bone, AVN, large traumatic lesions and large osteochondritis uh, discans. What the contraindications, so same as all cartilage procedures, instability, malalignment, meniscal deficiency, abnormal bone metabolism, because like I said, one of the biggest things is non-union. So you have to think about the, the bony uh, union. Smoking, again, I would say that it's probably in this scenario, because it's so expensive, it's an absolute contraindication. Steroid use, again, this is controversial, age or 40. Uh, again, it's a limited resource, I think, for, for us in the UK. So I think this is this is probably a reasonable thing. Um, obese, so BMI of 30 would be a contraindication and inflammatory arthritis. Fresh allograss, so uh, then to go st strict uh, protocols of screening, like all, uh, like tendon allografts, to reduce the, the risk of disease transmission. But obviously there is a very small uh, risk uh, still there um, it's it depends I've actually ha I have had them before 14 days but um, the that process of screening blood tests bacteriology um, that does take some time so there is this sort of mandatory lag period before you could actually get hold of a graph so your actual window of treatment is somewhere between two and three weeks um, following harvest um, the graft dispersed and antibiotic solution, uh, fresh allograft then are refrigerated at 4 uh, degrees C um, in uh, Ringer's Lactate. It's not put in the freezer because it's all about cell viability and this is what you really want to see when you image these with comfort microscopy because there is an inverse relationship uh, between storage time and viability and that's where the magic 28 days come into it. Essentially after 28 days, the chondrocyte viability drops off below 80%, and that seems to be the watershed moment between clinical success and, and failure. The results are much better if your viability is above 80%, uh, and that's why the 28 days is, 
is in place. I think there's a lot of uh, confusion amongst the language used with allograft. So uh, these are your other two options. So you're fresh, used within 28 days. The other option is fresh frozen. Uh, I wish they'd take the fresh away, so just say frozen. <laughs> so this is stored at minus 80. So this is put in the freezer and stored. It can be kept for five years, but essentially um, everything's dead within it. So you've got complete cell death. You get crystal formation within the cottage and um, yeah, that the, there is no viability in this scenario, uh, but because it's in the freezer, you have decreased immunogenicity um, and reduced potentially reduced disease transmission because of the storage conditions. But this is a non-viable graft, and then there's this graft cryopreserve, which is trying to sort of improve that 28 days because logistically 28 days is a problem for both the clinician, the patient and the companies because um, you can imagine if that graft is not matched and accepted within 20 days they have to throw it away so, or, or freeze it. But it then becomes a non-viable graft. graft. So, um, so people are trying to preserve or elongate that storage time by using uh, a cryoprotectant. Uh, That's usually glycerol. The problem is, is that because cartilage is avascular, it's not the glycerol can penetrate the superficial layers uh, and therefore it can uh, preserve the cells on top but it can't really penetrate the deep layers and you get a lot of cell death uh, close to the uh, tide mark area and um, last time I heard because um, NHS uh, or the NHS tissue bank are trying to explore this they can maintain their viability about 60% <coughs> which is obviously below the 80% uh, target mm -hmm. And this is the main restriction, really, funding. So uh, before undertaking one of these, you've got to um, apply for an uh, individual funding request. It gets a bit traumatic uh, after a while doing uh, different um, uh, uh, requests with different uh, commissioning groups. And this is the issue, really. So it's 12 to 13,000 uh, uh, pounds for a hemicondyle. Um, and that you got to remember that's just the condo the actual uh, we looked at my last 10 and um, yeah the prices range for the whole hospital admission including drugs and everything somewhere ranges between 17 and a half thousand and 23,000 depending on what you're doing and concomitant procedures so uh, it is a significant funding uh, uh, funding issue what investigations um, Alignment films, essential, pre and post. All my patients, I'm going to show you selection now, but I'm only doing this in the most severe cases. So usually they are significant bone loss or um, there is often malalignment. And sometimes you don't know if, if the malalignment uh, truly exists until after you've implanted as well. So it's important to do alignment films pre and post surgery. MRI to assess the meniscal volume, ligament instability. Um, Allograft sizing, that can be done off a number of things, it can be done off x-ray, MR or CT uh, and then I think actually because these are so expensive I think um, I actually do an arthroscopy on every patient before I, I actually think about doing the allograft because you don't want to listen for an allograft and then get there and realise well it's not that bad uh, and you've got £12,000 of allograft sitting on your desk which you can't give back so uh, I think an arthroscopy is an essential uh, part of this. And then the practicalities, you have to, so you, you've managed to get funding, you've uh, made sure everything else is perfect, you send the scans off to the company and then you have to sit and wait, wait for a match. This could take months. Um, and then you get a phone call and they say, right, we have a potential match. They send you the sizes, you say if you're happy, and then you have to phone the patient. And then you say, are you in the country? Are you well? Um, you have to make sure that patient as well because once you accept it that graft is yours and you cannot give it back um, and like I said before you usually have about two two and a half weeks then to plan the surgery so you, you usually have to move things around and what are the results why go to this length uh, because the results are pretty impressive and they can bail you out of some pretty severe situations so our gross uh, in Toronto obviously has uh, a wealth of experience but, and he's shown survivorship analysis demonstrate at 95% at 5 years and 85% at 10. He's actually got some data going out to 20 years as well. Um, and then another period, 88% of athletes achieved uh, limited return to sport with full return. 
Pringy level. This you have to be careful how you interpret the data, but so Al Grosses, I've seen some of his kits when I was in Canada and, and he tend to use them on, on pretty severe defects. When you get into this scenario, there we're talking about two different things. These are for localized lesions because it's much more available in the States than it is in the UK, but it you can actually restore pretty good function. The results of tibia are worse. You can do a retrograde type technique, um, but it's 80% of 10 years, 65% of 15. And then um, patella, worse again. Uh, so at 10 years, it's 67%. And then the worst <laughs> is uh, a bipolar graft. So you can do a bipolar graft, but you're only talking 60% of five years and 40% of 10 years. So for isolated lesions, it's very good. But then as the uh, lesions get worse, that so do the results. Okay, so I'm just going to show you selection of my cases. So uh, this is something, this is probably the main reason I, I do osconolograft. Obviously, at my hospital, uh, I see a lot of this, uh, a phenomenal amount of this, because it's obviously an oncology hospital, and uh, I see a lot of post-chemotherapy, AVN. Uh, the problem is that these patients have just got over leukemia or lymphoma, and then they have to live with the consequences of the treatment. And they're 20, you know, teenagers, early 20s, and then they've got this uh, widespread patchy uh, avascular necrosis. Having seen a, a lot of this, um, my probably advice to you would be that you can ignore a lot of it. It looks a lot worse than it is. So essentially, if you see something like this, where you get these sort of lesions that go up to the, the, the joint surface, but you get this sort of reasonable gap between the two, you can ignore that. In my experience, generally that is completely asymptomatic. Um, these are the ones that the problem where they go right up to the joint space and then they get claps and then that's when it becomes uh, symptomatic. And then you go in arthroscopically and you see something like this and basically the whole condor is just sort of peeling away and they've got this yellowy avascular uh, bone underneath and it's all dead basically. So in this case, uh, she, she was a 22-year-old uh, young girl post-chemotherapy, uh, so they were relatively contained. So I ignored the uh, tibial plateau uh, and just concentrated on that media femoconda. And so she had two uh, large uh, mega oats because they were central defects. Um, and this is the main, uh, this is the easiest of the uh, techniques. And how do you do that? You, you take the hemicondo, that's what you get essentially. You can, uh, there's a few companies that sort of have these jigs that you can help you create these mega oats. What you have to do is stabilize it within the jig um, so that you can create your uh, core. Then you have the, these uh, little templates, and what you have to do is you reference the lesion in the knee off the lesion on the hemicondyle, and you can use the notch as a reference and try and match it perfectly to your hemicondyle because this hemicondyle has been matched perfect to your patient. And then you use these uh, cylinders to try and align up and work out exactly where you're going to take it. Once, you, um, once you've done that, then obviously you can't drill a wire through the cartilage because that obviously defeats the object of it. Um, because it's quite a sturdy wire uh, that you drill on the where the lesion is going to go, where you core it out to create a uh, a dowel. But so you have to use this jig thing. So what you have to do is place this perpendicular exactly where you want it. This then secures uh, that trial in that alignment, and then you take out the trial, and then you bring out the core, which then will create this core. Um, exactly where you want it without damaging the cartilage. You need to mark it so you geographically you know which is up and which is down. Um, and yeah, you need a lot, lot of irrigation because uh, obviously it's all about cell viability. You need to keep these cells alive so heat is not a great thing. Um, and then what you do, you've, you've put that template that you've created to, to create this, you put that onto the, the the, the knee over the defect, again perpendicular, you drill a wire through it, you use a corer to create a defect, and then you uh, measure at all four corners the depth of that defect, and then you can cut that with a saw so you have a perfect fit. And then you, you have to place it in, not with a hammer, but with your thumb. Again, thinking about chondrocyte viability. So this is that same individual, 18 months post-surgery. So again, yeah, we ignored this, ignored this, because they weren't breaching the cortex. 
that was the collapsed area and she's got gone on to get good union we've recreated the joint space reasonably well but you can obviously see where that plug was but it thankfully it's united and uh, the highland cartilage over the top is, is reasonable um, and that probably was my first one actually uh, and i think that's now six years down the line she's in liverpool somewhere uh, you can use for bone tumour, obviously again, because I work in a tumour hospital, we, we see this. So this unfortunately was a 17 year old uh, lad who'd been treated uh, for an osteochondral, um, osteochondral desiccans uh, and Whitney, uh, but he's, uh, he may not project with the lights, but he's got a lytic lesion in the uh, femoral condyle and essentially on the MRI scan, oh, sorry, on the MRI scan it uh, was a, um, a chondroblastoma. So um, which is here. Uh, it's difficult actually treating tumours because uh, you have to wait for a match and the whole time the patient's got a tumour even though it's a relatively benign tumour there's a lot of angst around this but ultimately if you remove this it's going to be a really big defect in a 17 year old and it's very difficult because of the way the funding works it's much easier to get the funding at the time of the surgery than it is later on uh, but yeah so he went on to have again a mega oats because that tumour had, had sort of dilated the uh, the femoral condyle, we had to um, it, it you didn't get that nice interference fix because if you are below twenty five mil sort of mega oak, then you don't need to have fixation. This one is a thirty mil, uh, and because we'd blown out or this was sort of dilated, we didn't have that nice interference fit, and so we had to put some uh, smart nails in just to stabilise that um, because obviously uh, stability is important for the bony union. Then large fail OCD is probably the next most common thing that I see. Um, and this is one of my patients, 25 year old who was discharged from the army because of this OCD. Um, it was six uh, square centimeters at the initial time of arthroscopy and we sort of pinned that back. This isn't the patient, I just couldn't find his pictures, but this is essentially what I did. He just had some uh, smart nails just to pin that back, but it never really settled down. Um, and it was it never really healed uh, back on he still complained of pain so we went back in and basically some of it are healed on and some of it hadn't so we 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 just tried to do a I tried to do a bone marrow concentrate and uh, hyaluronic acid patch but it again didn't really work and and so uh, basically the whole of this back condyle fell off um, and so we went on to do an osteochondral allograft so this is the the next type of allograft so um, when you've got such a large defect and it goes posterior, you can't go perpendicular, so you have to do a shell allograft. So um, so what you do is get the hemicondyle and then you have to just cut off what you need and then you have to try and fit that into the patient's uh, knee. So you can see it's quite a large part of his uh, posterior condyle. Um, and it's a pure freehand uh, event. So therefore it can take hours, today's, <laughs> Um, but you just freehand cut off the uh, defect and then you just have to uh, freehand again trying to get the exact part off the hemiconda and then it's just a lot of burring, fit in, burring, fit in until you get it right and uh, you have to use image intensifier to do that and that was the end result in him so uh, again you can get some really nice fit with the um, with this pre-op CTs and it fit quite nicely um, once you get on and then these are non weight bearing for uh, three months when they're big shell allografts. So uh, what I do is at six weeks, I bring them back, do some alignment films um, at six weeks because that can take some time and I don't want to do an osteotomy at that stage. It's just too long. Uh, we recheck his alignment at six weeks and then if they're uh, maligned, then go on to do an osteotomy. Um, so we went on and did an opening wedge, lateral um, lateral opening wedge to the osteotomy to get him out of valgus. And, um, the idea being that it will address his uh, valgus inflection as well as extension and the other option, the other reason is you don't really want to do an osteotom in the femur because it does damage the blood supply to the condom so you want to ideally do it off the opposite bone as well and that was him at 12 months so um, yeah reconstituted the the, uh, the bony geometry pretty well it, it healed on nicely um, you can they often do remain a slightly different uh, colour uh, for a few years, so you can see it's a little bit more dense there, um, but he, he, he's done pretty well. And then failed cartilage procedures. Um, so this 28-year-old, uh, 
he's quite interesting because he had a massive OCD when he was uh, 15 or 16 and then he was treated down south with a frozen allograft, so a completely non-viable graft. Um, he did well initially but within two years the knee just sort of went and essentially it's completely disintegrated because it was non-viable, it never really healed on, it fragmented uh, and it, you, um, it just sort of crumbled basically. Uh, the staples basically because they took off the uh, lateral collateral to get access to the uh, to the condo when doing the allograft, and then that and then basically this was his arthroscopy. Um, so essentially, again, this just this fragmented, horrible surface with all the way back. He started to wear the tibia. Um, yeah, I know that, and the problem is then you have this decision. You go, oh right, okay, what the hell do I do about the tibia? Do I just do one side, do both? But the results of bipolar are so bad that um, essentially uh, we just decided to do one. I showed it around a few guys from the States and they said just do the one side. Um, they thought the tibia was sort of acceptable, but obviously you can see that the femur is just falling away. And again, this was an even bigger graph, so this is sort of thing. So you have to just sort of, um, yeah, again, free hand. So it's a bit like doing a free hand <coughs> uni. You take off the posterior condyles, take off the distal condyles, and then um, you basically just create this graft. You ideally want to keep the bone to an absolute minimum because the bone contains the host uh, marrow cells which are potentially allergenic and that could be one reason for non-union because it, it, it could generate a, 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 a um, rejection type response where the cartilage is uh, immunoprivileged so it doesn't. So uh, some of the non-unions are thought to be uh, related to the marrow so you have to lavage it with power lavage to get rid of as much marrow as possible but you want to keep the bone to an absolute minimum but when you've got such big grafts you, you have to be really careful because you don't want it to fracture because that would be a bit of a disaster. Um, and again so that's the sort of fit that you get, you get sort of completely reconstituted um, in there and we actually, because he was so stiff and they took the condyle off, we actually take off his uh, anterior root, the meniscus, just to get access to the back because this thing goes all the way to the back of his knee uh, and then we just had to repair that at, at the end. And then this is him at 40 months post-surgery. So uh, yeah, the allograft goes all the way from there and up here. And again, you can see it's slightly different uh, density, um, but uh, it's, it's healed on nicely. And then post-trauma. <laughs> is another potential indication. So this one is a, uh, he's a, um, I think he's, he's 32, he had a Hoffer's fracture which was fixed, uh, he's in slight varus. So we did a, an arthroscopy check that he was suitable for the allograft. At, at that time then did a, a, a high tibial osteotomy to get him out of uh, varus um, and then we came back then to do the uh, allograft. Uh, and again, it's another big shell uh, allograft so you create another big defect. You have uh, another big uh, free graft of virtually involving the hula condor and you sort of fit, <coughs> fit it on uh, freehand. And like I said, with the arthroscopy, uh, interruptive uh, fluoroscopy, you can sort of see the graft goes all the way to the back and involves the distal uh, condors as well. And this was him at 16 months post-surgery, uh, completely healed on. And um, we, we did a second look when we took out his osteotomy plate um, and uh, so I took them all out, like uh, Adrian, and uh, yeah, it looked actually very good at 16 months. And then lastly, uh, salvage. So you can do some pretty, um, uh, you can be as brave or as stupid as you want. So this is, uh, again, been in Birmingham, uh, you get soldiers <laughs> from Afghanistan, so when the war was on. So this is a 21 year old Gurkha, got blown up by, um, by an IED essentially just sort of blew uh, off his lateral femur condyle. Um, he went to the uh, trauma center of excellence and uh, got sprayed by a nail gun. And then um, <laughs> he, uh, they took out some of the metal work and then he was just left with this very large uh, shark bite in the lateral femur condyle. Uh, they had repaired his lateral structures and they were re relatively stable, uh, but he was in a uh, valgus as well. So um, yeah, when you get in it just looked literally like a bomb had gone off in his knee uh, and uh, yeah the, the whole condo was gone but also the tibia was trashed he had no meniscus and so uh, what we had to do in that scenario is uh, we got an actual uh, so we did a biological compartment replacement so we took a tibia uh, left the meniscus attached to the tibia um, and then got a hemicondyle freehand cut the hemicondyle like we did in the other cases 
um, and then freehand cut. We did a like a, a unicondylar tibia, slotted the tibia on, slotted the femur on, left the meniscus in place, and did a meniscal allograft. And um, in one, and then so it, yeah, we managed to reconstitute the femur and the tibia, and um, yeah, we did the meniscal allograft at the same time. And then we came back six weeks later and did a uh, medial uh, closing wedge osteotomy to get him out of the valgus. And this is him uh, at. Um, 18 months post surgery, uh, going back to Nepal to help his parents out with the earthquake. Uh, although he's been kicked out of the army, I did see, I did rescope him and I took his plate out. It looked terrible, but um, he had absolutely no pain. I think it's just because it's completely a new role, so he doesn't have any pain sensation. But um, yeah, I, I can see why the results are not so good in bipolar graphs. And then the future. Um, so there's talk because of that immunological reaction, the blood typing. Uh, people are starting to blood type now in the States. Um, potentially, this instant product, I think the results will be instant C, prochondrex, so it's sort of taking shavings of the actual uh, live uh, cartilage cells. So it's like a, a membrane, but with live uh, chondrocytes on it. And then, obviously, you've got the pre-made dials. That'll reduce the costs. Uh, so you can do like a order just a 25 uh, mega so there's been some good data now that actually you can use mismatch you don't have to size if you're using less than 25 uh, dowels you don't really have to size match the whole condyle you can accept and uh, they fit reasonably well and you don't even have to use the same condyle so you can use a lateral condyle for a medial uh, if you're less than 25 the bigger you get though you have to match the the uh, curvature and then ultimately you know the finances are going to really determine how well and how further we can go with it. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Any questions?